Hello, Sean Munger here, and welcome back to Bond in Context, where I'm explaining the historical context of all the James Bond films in order. This is number 20 in the series, not counting the introduction, and today I am doing The World is Not Enough from 1999, the final Bond film of the 20th century, the third with Pierce Brosnan, and the last Bond film before 9-11. I started this series more than three years ago, and a lot has changed in that time. There's a new Bond film out now, No Time to Die, starring Daniel Craig. That's his final film, possibly the final Bond film ever, which I saw just recently, and it's pretty good. And of course, the world is quite different now than it was when I started this series. The pandemic has changed everything. Anyway, that's water under the bridge. The World is Not Enough, released in November 1999, is the 19th Bond film and the follow-up to Tomorrow Never Dies. The plot involves James Bond's attempts to stop a uh, plot to blow up Istanbul with a nuclear explosion, to make an oil pipeline going across Azerbaijan, owned by Electra King, one of the film's two villains, more valuable. The film is heavily steeped in the geopolitics of petroleum, which is one reason why it's on the list of films to be covered on my podcast, Green Screen, the environmental movie podcast, although we haven't gotten around to doing this one yet. The World is Not Enough is, in my opinion, a pretty middling Bond film. It's not top tier and it's not bottom tier. On the whole, it's fairly unmemorable. I think a Bond film is as strong as its villain. Although there are two here, Electra King, played by French actress Sophie Marceau, and Renard, played by Scottish actor Robert Carlyle, most famous at this point for his role in the musical comedy The Full Monty. Sort of an odd choice for a Bond villain, but there you go. I think both villains are pretty weak, and the script of The World is Not Enough is sort of a mess, but it is an enjoyable movie. A serious downside of the picture is the casting of Denise Richards as Christmas Jones, Bond's primary love interest. Christmas Jones is supposed to be a nuclear engineer with a PhD. Having gotten a PhD myself and not in STEM, let me tell you from experience that however beautiful you may be going in, you're not going to come out of seven years or more of graduate school in the hard sciences looking like this. That's not a dig on Denise Richards or on the women who work in STEM who are amazing, but Denise Richards is just, I think, the wrong representation of them. But that's just my opinion. So now let's get down to the historical context. The period of the film's production and release, 1998 and 99, was sort of a calm before the storm, so to speak, the storm being the September 11th attacks. As you'll recall from the last video on Tomorrow Never Dies, Tony Blair had become Prime Minister of the UK in May 1997 after a landslide election victory, returning Labour to number 10 for the first time since 1979. Blair's governance, however, was surprisingly conservative, echoing his opposite number, Bill Clinton, in the U.S., whose New Democrats were the blueprint for new labor and followed many of the same pro-business principles. Even in this period, 1998 and 99, there were rumblings of what would eventually become Brexit. Despite his general inclination toward engagement with Europe, Blair decided against the U.K. joining the common currency, the euro, which was scheduled to be phased in beginning in 2001. There were opponents of close relations with the European Union, Eurosceptics we call them, in both the Labour and Conservative parties at this time. This was before the UK political system became polarized in the Brexit era between essentially a Leave party and a Remain party. They don't have those exact names, but those are largely their positions. But then again, we're skipping ahead here. Anyway, Blair did try to reverse to some extent the massive government disinvestment in public infrastructure and social welfare that Margaret Thatcher had presided over. He also had a significant foreign policy success, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, which finally brought to an end the 30-year insurgency in Northern Ireland known as the Troubles, a problem that all previous British governments going back to Harold Wilson had been unable to solve. However, even in this period, the calm before the storm, there are roots of what would eventually be Blair's downfall, and Tony Blair is one of the most tragic stories of modern political history. During this period, and especially the spring of 1999, 
Blair worked closely with Bill Clinton to motivate and sustain NATO military involvement, principally heavy airstrikes against Yugoslavian forces repressing and massacring Muslim Albanians in Kosovo. Now, this was more or less a successful intervention, and Blair had good cause to be proud of it. Ultimately, though, it demonstrated Blair's ultimate weakness, which was his inability to recognize the difference between military intervention for good reasons and for bad reasons. Blair believed heavily in sort of a military humanism, the involvement of powerful nations in conflicts for principally humanitarian reasons, often to stop genocides. Clinton had already been burned on this kind of thing once before, when he refused to intervene in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. Blair very much wanted to avoid similar mistakes. Unfortunately, as we'll see later on, he read George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq in 2003 as being a similar primarily humanitarian crusade that did not go well for the UK or for George W. Bush for that matter, but again, we're skipping ahead. In the United States, speaking of Bill Clinton, this period, 1998-99, was essentially his Guter Damerung, the low point of his political career, as he found himself swamped by the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Clinton had begun his affair with Lewinsky in 1995, but it didn't become public until January 1998. The origins and progression of this scandal is beyond our scope here. Suffice it to say that it came out of the increasing polarization of the American political spectrum. Republicans, shocked and dismayed by Clinton's election in 1992 and especially his re-election in 96, were scrambling for any stick they could find to beat Clinton with. Quite conveniently, he handed them the seeds of his own downfall on a silver platter by having an affair with Monica, then age 22, and then committing perjury in a deposition. Clinton stonewalled but was forced to come clean about the affair in August 1998, at least publicly, despite high approval ratings and the general sense among the public that Clinton's private wrongdoings didn't affect his public performance, Republicans went whole hog on impeaching him, an effort that failed. In February 1999, Clinton was acquitted by the Senate. Right now, in the years since the Me Too movement began shining a new public light on sexual harassment and gender issues, we're now going through a reevaluation of the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal. Lewinsky herself was treated by the media largely as a figure of fun and derision, the real damage that powerful men like Clinton can and regularly do to women was lost in the shuffle. And although stories of much worse sexual misconduct by Clinton, including rape, were out there in 1998, they too were largely swept under the rug at the time. Now more than 20 years on, it's much easier to see Clinton for what he was, a sexual predator. The shifting views of gender issues and toxic masculinity do have implications, very big implications, for the James Bond franchise, which has struggled with these issues before, and that's why I'm mentioning it now. Only four years before this film, Bond was derided on screen as a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, but that line from Goldeneye was largely played for laughs. It would not be today. The Clinton-Lewinsky scandal is one of the things that started to change public perception of this sort of thing. The World is Not Enough is one of those Bond films that really tries to embrace the context of its times. Oil-driven geopolitics was an increasingly big deal in the late 1990s, this despite public awareness of human-caused global warming and the increasingly urgent need to stop fossil fuel use and production. Not a single global-level economic power was pursuing that course at this time, and still isn't for the most part. Barbara Broccoli, now the producer of the Bond franchise, got the whole idea for the film by watching a news report in 1997 about how oil companies were scrambling to control formerly untapped oil production from the Caspian Sea region in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's true, a number of pipelines were built and proposed to be built across former Soviet republics in Central Asia to market oil, principally to Western countries. Vladimir Putin would not become Russia's leader until late December 1999, a month after the release of The World Is Not Enough. But in the late 1990s, he was already moving behind the scenes to secure the stability and legitimacy of the Russian government by making deals with Russian oligarchs oil and natural gas barons principally. Oil is the entire basis of the economic power of Putin's government. 
This was not known in 1999, of course, at least not publicly uh, well acknowledged, but it would become very obvious later. Incidentally, if you want a deep dive on this particular subject, I teach an online class about Putin on my website, which explains how all of this came to be. The film also plays with various plot and character threads left over from GoldenEye, which heavily embraced the new reality of post-Soviet Russia. For example, we have another appearance by Robbie Coltrane as Valentin Zhukovsky, a Russian gangster. Organized crime in post-Soviet Russia was a huge thing in Western media in the late 90s, so it's not surprising that the Bond series did something with it. This was Coltrane's last appearance as that character. The plot also deals with a universal fear in the West following the Soviet collapse, the potential availability of former Soviet nuclear assets on the black market, or their potential delivery to rogue states or terrorists. This is how the submarine in Istanbul gets into the story. Notably, it's not in this film, but the previous one, Tomorrow Never Dies, where a British general says to a Russian, damn it, can't your people keep anything locked up? But the sentiment is definitely there in this one. Fear of ex-Soviet nukes being born again as terrorist or organized crime weapons was a big deal in this period, much less so today, in part because nuclear weapons degrade over time, and now 30 years out from the fall of the Soviet Union, there's not much left laying around still in working order. But in 1999, this was a huge fear. This is the first of the Bond films really to start using the character of M as a plot device. It's easy to see why. Judy Dench, back for her third round as Bond's boss, is so good that you got to do something with her. In the world is not enough. She's kidnapped, she would, which would also happen in Skyfall, and of course Bond has to go rescue her. Dench was an especially good draw for audiences in 1999 because she had just won an Academy Award for portraying Queen Elizabeth in Shakespeare in Love. These later Bond pictures show an increasing tilt toward A-list talent. Judy Dench's appearance in The World Is Not Enough is only the second time that any performer has appeared in a Bond film after winning an Academy Award. The only previous one was Christopher Walken in A View to a Kill, but future Oscar winners Javier Bardem and Christoph Waltz, future and future Oscar-winning director Sam Mendes, were yet to come. Still, there's a sense that the Bond franchise is kind of coasting at this point. Unlike Sean Connery and Roger Moore, both of whose third Bond films were their best, Brosnan didn't really resonate culturally as James Bond the same way that they did. Consequently, he seems a little bit less enthusiastic and energetic, and because the film doesn't really give us any icon truly iconic moments, this is why I think The World Is Not Enough is kind of forgotten in the Bond franchise, with the exception of the theme song by Garbage, undoubtedly one of the best in the whole series. The World Is Not Enough opened in late November 1999 and made huge box office returns, ultimately emerging as the highest grossing Bond film until the next one, Die Another Day. Critical reception was decidedly mixed, and Denise Richards' performance was especially savaged. In fact, she won a Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Supporting Actress, a dubious honor she shares with the next Bond girl, Halle Berry, who admittedly did not win her Razzie for her Bond performance. This might be one of the shorter videos because I don't have a whole lot to say about The World Is Not Enough. It has some good moments, and it's substantial enough to satisfy your general hardcore Bond fan, but there's really nothing special here. Historically speaking, the 1998-99 period is difficult to assess without invoking the hindsight of 9-11, the calm before the storm narrative that I mentioned at the top of this video. Though I'm not bullish on it, it's at least possible that in future years the world is not enough might have significant potential for re-evaluation in the Bond universe, if you can get past Denise Richards. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, share, do all that stuff you normally do for a video you like, and I'll be back soon with another video. Hello to all my new subscribers. Thanks.